Greetings, and welcome back to the channel as we continue to delve into the history of science fiction cinema. 1943 is not exactly a memorable year for science fiction. Studios still didn't take the genre seriously, and they gave us more mad scientists and their unethical experiments. But there were some glimmers of ingenuity which would have far-reaching consequences. The first monster team-up, early zombie films, and the first appearance of DC Comics' greatest character. All the cinematic genres of this time were shaped by the ongoing global conflict, as the war demanded substantial resources and attention. The film industry experienced budget cuts and a shift in focus, impacting how science fiction was produced and perceived. Studios, often constrained by lower budgets and wartime priorities, were forced to cut corners on costume and makeup design, set designs, and visual effects, leading to a marked reduction in the genre's quality. The films of this period were often relegated to the status of low-budget productions, or B-films. Each of these were influenced by the demands of wartime production, but still managed to contribute to the evolution of the genre, blending elements of science fiction, horror, patriotism, and espionage to reflect the anxieties and themes of their time. At this time, Universal Monsters were evolving and moving away from science fiction themes. The studio capitalized on its famous monster characters and tried new ideas. While Frankenstein meets the Wolfman still included elements of science fiction with mad scientist and resurrection through medical means, the Universal Monsters were becoming more focused on horror than science fiction. But there were still hints of sci-fi in one of Universal's offerings this year. According to legend, the idea of the Monster Rally films came from screenwriter Kurt Seedmack's need for money to buy a new car. He allegedly pitched the idea to producer George Wagner, who made the project happen and thus marked a new milestone with the studio's first monster mashup. It seems obvious today to show popular characters from separate films fighting in a shared cinematic universe. But the idea got started in 1943 with Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman and set the stage for future crossover movies that brought together iconic monsters into a single narrative. Directed by Roy William Neal, an Irish filmmaker known for his work on Sherlock Holmes films, the movie featured Lon Chaney Jr. as the Wolfman, Bella Lugosi as Frankenstein's monster, and Ileona Massey as Elsa Frankenstein. Kurt Seedmack, a prolific screenwriter and novelist, penned the script. I've discussed Chaney in previous films like Ghost of Frankenstein and Man Made Monster. Massey in last year's Invisible Agent, and Seedmack was Universal's go to writer in the horror and sci fi genre at the time. The plot revolves around Larry Talbot, known as the Wolfman, who is resurrected by grave robbers and wants to find a way to end his cursed existence. His quest leads him to the village of Vasaria, where he hopes to find Dr. Frankenstein and a cure. Instead, he encounters Frankenstein's monster and the usual angry mob of townspeople who are tired of the Frankenstein family causing trouble. The monster's story takes place after The Ghost of Frankenstein, where the monster acquired Igor's brain and voice. The monster in this version was originally supposed to speak, but Bela Lugosi's thick Hungarian accent resulted in test audiences laughing, and so his lines were cut. This does create some confusion and unintentional humor in the final film. It didn't help that in addition to taking out his lines, they also removed the plot point that the monster was blinded after the events of the previous film. Because of this, the monster wanders around with no explanation. The production was challenging at times. The small town was supposed to be located in Germany, but was changed because of the ongoing war to a fictional setting. Cheney initially wanted to play both the Wolfman 
and Frankenstein's monster. But the producers thought it would be too demanding, so he kept the role as the Wolfman, and Lugosi played the monster. Actress Maria Utsminskaya, reprising her role from the Wolfman, was injured on set, and Lugosi suffered from exhaustion due to the 35 pounds of makeup and prosthetics. In the end, Lugosi's stuntman, Gil Perkins, filmed most of the monster's scenes, including close-ups when the monster is pulled out of the ice, as well as the final battle. Upon its release, the film received mixed reviews. Variety praised the script, saying it, quote, delivers a good job of fantastic writing to weave the necessary thriller ingredients into the piece, unquote. The New York Times, on the other hand, criticized the brief and underwhelming showdown between the monsters. Despite these critiques, the film's impact on the genre was undeniable. It paved the way for future monster rallies, such as House of Frankenstein, House of Dracula, and Abbott and Costello meet Frankenstein, solidifying the concept of a shared universe. The first half of the film is decent, with some good cinematography. But the fight at the end is way too short, and the film ends abruptly. There's no longer any real association with the original novel by Mary Shelley, and these films now stand on their own. Lon Chaney Jr. is better as Wolfman than as Frankenstein's monster, so I was glad he kept this role instead of trying to play both. But unfortunately, Lugosi was just phoning this one in and didn't put in much of an effort. He was 60 years old at the time, so I'm sure age, as well as his known addiction to morphine due to chronic pain management, didn't help his performance, and they really should have hired a younger actor for the role. Frankenstein Meets the Wolfman is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. Before we dive into the rest of the films of 1943, If you're enjoying the content, please hit like and subscribe for more episodes on the history of sci-fi cinema. You can also support my work on Patreon, which I'll link in the description below. Your support means a lot, and I appreciate everyone stopping by to share their love for this amazing genre. Sci-fi cinema was clearly about the bad scientist in the 1940s mostly low-budget B-movies from smaller studios and the occasional major studio. These films featured deranged men and their unorthodox experiments, blending horror with science fiction to reflect the fears of uncontrolled technology and their ethical limits. Universal Pictures released Captive Wild Woman, directed by Edward Dimitrik, known as one of the Hollywood Ten, a group of filmmakers who were blacklisted and jailed in the late 1940s for refusing to cooperate with Congress's investigation into alleged communist influences in the film industry. The film featured a cast that included John Carradine in his first starring role. He'll later go on to work on House of Frankenstein and House of Dracula. Evelyn Ankers, who we last saw in The Ghost of Frankenstein, plays Beth. Supporting cast includes Milbert Stone, Lloyd Corrigan, Vince Barnett, and Aquanetta, in her first major role as Paula, the ape woman. With makeup by the legendary Jack Pierce, best known for creating iconic monster looks for Universal Studios, including Frankenstein's monster, the mummy, and the wolfman. The film follows Dr. Walters, played by John Carradine, as he conducts twisted experiments to transform a female gorilla into a human woman, leading to to deadly consequences. Dr. Walters then convinces a local circus to hire Paula, the transformed gorilla, as an assistant to a lion tamer. However, things go awry, as they usually do in these films, when Paula's true nature emerges. She is driven by jealousy of another woman, competing for the affection of the same man. The film reused footage from the 1933 lion taming movie, the Big Cage, for the animal scenes intercut with the actors. Despite its mixed reviews, with some praising its thrills and others criticizing its story and performances, the film managed to spawn two sequels, Jungle Woman 
and the jungle captive. The New York Times noted, quote, There is nothing to recommend in the story or the performances. The picture as a whole is in decidedly bad taste, unquote. The film faced censorship challenges and notably altered the part of the script involving a brain transplant to avoid controversy from religious groups about the idea of moving a soul into a new body. Unfortunately, this is a pretty dull script, focusing more on reusing the animal training footage from the 1933 film instead of telling the story of the characters. There's an interesting premise here, but it is never fully developed. Captive Wild Woman is available on DVD and streaming on the Internet Archive. The Eight Man is an American film produced by Monogram Pictures and directed by William Bodine. Renowned for his prolific output, Bodine, who made over 170 films, was nicknamed One Shot for his practice of filming scenes in a single take, though this was not exactly a compliment at the time since his films were never really that good. Starring Bella Lugosi as Dr. James Brewster, a scientist whose experiments with apes results in his transformation into a half-human, half-ape creature. As Brewster spirals into madness, he becomes desperate to find a cure, resorting to murder to obtain the spinal fluid he believes will reverse his condition. The film also features Louise Curry as Billy Mason, who we last saw in 1941's The Adventures of Captain Marvel. She's joined by former vaudeville actor Wallace Ford as Jeff Carter, Henry Hall as Dr. George Randall, and Minerva Urakal as Agatha. Barney Sarecki, known for his work on other low-budget films such as Bowery at Midnight and The Corpse Vanishes, wrote the screenplay based on Carl Brown's short story, They Creep in the Dark. Originally titled The Guerrilla Strikes, the film was shot in just 19 days and was the sixth of Lugosi's nine films while under contract to Monogram. The Eight Man reflects the era's fascination with mad scientists, apes, and monstrous transformations. The film's low budget and Lugosi's questionable makeup garnered mostly negative reviews. Variety said it was, quote, good for laughs which aren't in the script. Unquote. While the Hollywood Reporter said that Lugosi's, quote, makeup in the film is horrible. Despite its critical reception, the studio greenlit Return of the Ape Man in 1944, though it is not exactly a direct sequel. I usually give Bella Lugosi films a thumbs up, but this one is just plain bad and felt very long, even though it was only an hour. Lugosi's ape makeup and obvious fake facial hair made this low-budget B film seem even cheaper. The Ape Man is available on DVD and Blu-ray, as well as streaming on the Internet Archive and YouTube. In the early 1940s, cinema saw an intriguing blend of horror and science fiction, with the use of zombie-like creatures controlled by mad scientists conducting unethical experiments. This subgenre reflected the era's fascination with science of the unknown, while also channeling the anxieties and moral questions raised by World War II. The war influenced these films by introducing themes of control, dehumanization, the ethical use of scientific advancements, and the desire for superhuman soldiers to fight for their chosen side. Revenge of the Zombies is an American film with slight sci-fi elements, produced by Monogram Pictures. It's a mad scientist story that blends with horror and comedy. Directed by Steve Sakili, a Hungarian filmmaker and former journalist who fled Hungary before the war. John Carradine stars in his second film in this episode. This time, as Dr. Max Heinrich von Alterman, Gail Storm as Jennifer Rand, Robert Lowry as Larry Adams. He would go on to play Batman in 1949's Batman and Robin. 
and two actors who appeared in this film's sort of predecessor, King of the Zombies, are Manton Moreland as Jeff Jackson, a comedian and actor, as well as Madame Saltewan, a longtime actress who appeared in 1915's The Birth of a Nation and 1916's Intolerance. She's known as the first African-American actress to sign a film contract and become a featured performer. The story follows Scott Warrington, who travels to a Louisiana mansion after learning of his sister Lila's mysterious death. He discovers that her husband, Dr. Max von Alterman, is a Nazi scientist, conducting experiments to create an army of zombie super soldiers for Germany. With the help of Detective Larry Adams and Servant Jeff, Scott uncovers the sinister plot. As they delve deeper into the mansion's secrets, they confront the reanimated Lila and other undead creatures. Revenge of the Zombies was initially conceived as a follow-up to King of the Zombies from 1941. And just like almost every other film in the horror or sci-fi genre, it was initially supposed to involve the genre's go-to guy, Bella Lugosi, but the studio went in a different direction. This film could have been a lot better, but there were too many unnecessary scenes, and they kept trying to go back and forth between comedy and drama. I drove a car like this for Master. Yes? Yeah. When I was alive. Oh, when you was alive? Hmm? When you was alive? That did it. The deaths are all off screen, so there is no horror or mystery. The idea for this story sounded very intriguing, but the script just didn't work. Revenge of the Zombies is available on DVD and streaming on YouTube and the Internet Archive. The Mad Ghoul, produced by Universal Studios, is an American horror sci-fi hybrid with what we'd later see as early zombie elements. Though unlike the traditional zombies, this story focuses on ghouls, mindless and obedient but living, mind-controlled people instead of the undead. Directed by James P. Hogan, this was his final film. Hogan tragically passed away from a heart attack a week after the film's release. He's known on this channel for directing films I've discussed in earlier episodes, like Life Returns from 1935 and Arrest Bulldog Drummond from 1939. The film stars George Zuko, known for his mad scientist characters, who this time takes on the role of Dr. Alfred Morris. He's joined by Torhan Bey as Eric Iverson, an actor nicknamed the Turkish Delight by his fans. Evelyn Ankers plays Isabel Lewis, noted for her roles in this year's Captive Wild Woman, for earlier films The Wolfman and The Ghost of Frankenstein. And David Bruce portrays Ted Allison, a relatively unknown actor, and this is the role for which he is best remembered. The screenplay, based on a story by Hans Crayley, was written by Paul Gangelin, who would later co-write The Giant Claw in 1957. And co-writer Brenda Weisberg, a later contributor to The Mummy's Ghost, in 1944. The film centers on Dr. Alfred Morris, a chemistry professor who discovers an ancient Mayan gas that induces a death-like trance. He experiments on his assistant, Ted Allison, transforming him into a zombie-like creature to keep under his control. Dr. Morris, who is now obsessed with Isabel, uses Ted to eliminate any rivals. And Ted, now trapped in his trance-like existence, struggles to regain his humanity and break free. Initially titled The Mystery of the Mad Ghoul, the film was intended to be a double feature with Son of Dracula. The film received mixed reviews, but most praised George Zuko's performance. Actress Evelyn Ankers wanted to use this opportunity to play a famed singer to showcase her own singing talents, but her vocals were ultimately removed and replaced by performer Lillian Cornell, much to Ankers' disappointment. The plot is pretty standard. Unfortunately, we never actually see Ted transform into a ghoul. 
By now, visual effects and makeup standards were up to the point where they could easily show a visual transformation. Famed makeup artist Jack Pierce, known for his work on The Mummy, did the work on this film, so I'm not sure why they never fully utilized his talents. The Mad Ghoul is available on DVD and Blu-ray as part of the Universal Horror Collection and streaming on the Internet Archive, which I'll link in the description below. In the early 1940s, superhero serials began to take shape with the release of The Adventures of Captain Marvel in 1941. Produced by Republic Pictures, Captain Marvel set a high standard with its engaging story and production values, demonstrating the commercial potential of superhero serials. In contrast, the Batman serial, produced by Columbia Pictures this year, was released during the war and reflected the era's wartime context. The low-budget hurt the production quality, but it marked a significant milestone as the first live-action adaptation of the iconic DC comic book character. Directed by Lambert Hillier, a veteran filmmaker known for his work on serials and B-movies, this 15-episode story is set against the backdrop of World War II and portrays Batman as a secret U.S. government asset combating the Japanese agent, Dr. Daka, played by the versatile actor, J. Carol Nace, who we last saw in 1942's Dr. Renault's Secret. Lewis Wilson stars as Batman, and Douglas Croft takes on the role of his youthful sidekick, Robin. Their adventures involve thwarting Dr. Daka's various schemes, including his attempts to use a radium-powered death ray and an army of zombified henchmen. Shirley Patterson and William Austin round out the cast as Linda and Alfred. The serial features elements such as the Batcave, and due to budget constraints, we only get an early version of the Batmobile, which is just a regular car with Alfred driving. This serial laid the groundwork for future Batman adaptations, including the 1949 sequel, Batman and Robin, and a later popular television series starring Adam West. There were animated series and feature films. While the series is a product of its time, including problematic racial depictions of Japanese characters and the use of racial slurs, it represents a formative chapter in the Batman legacy. The serialized format with its cliffhangers, high-tech sci-fi gadgets, and episodic storytelling established a template for future superhero adaptations and contributed to the character's enduring popularity. It's the gadgets that puts this comic book character adaptation into the sci-fi genre. It's campy and cheesy, and the costumes and sets are cheaply made. It's not exactly well-written or well-acted, but if you're a Batman fan, I recommend checking out this dated serial, but I don't recommend taking it too seriously. Batman is available on DVD and streaming on Tubi TV in the United States, as well as YouTube and the Internet Archive. And just a quick note, I've linked all the films discussed today in the description below if you would like to check them out. Despite the chaos of the war, 1943 saw several noteworthy science fiction works that explored imaginative concepts and futuristic ideas. So I want to take a brief look at the state of sci-fi literature at the time, most of which was published in serial form, in pulp magazines, and then later in novel form. Ashes, Ashes by René Barzavel, A post-apocalyptic French novel about an advanced group that falls into disorder after electricity disappears. Earth's Last Citadel by Henry Kuttner and C.L. Moore Published in Argosy magazine, this story tells the tale of four people from World War II who find themselves pushed into the far future. Gather Darkness by Fritz Lieber Serialized in astounding science fiction, this story explores a future where a theocratic dictatorship rules Earth, and a resistance group uses science disguised as magic to fight back. 
It blends elements of dystopia and rebellion, reflecting the contemporary anxieties of war and authoritarianism. Mimsy Were the Borough Groves by Henry Kuttner and C.L. Moore Published in Astounding Science Fiction, this story tells the tale of children who find a box of educational toys from the future, which radically alter their cognitive abilities. Mimsy Were the Borough Groves was adapted into a 1970 French television production and a 2007 American feature titled The Last Mimsy. There was also a 1976 spoken word album narrated by William Shatner. The events of 1943 were profoundly shaped by the war, and this would later influence the realm of science fiction cinema. To truly grasp the themes and narratives of sci-fi films from the late 1940s and 1950s, it's essential to examine the pivotal events of any given era. And so for the rest of this episode, I'll take a snapshot of the historical and cultural milestones of 1943 that left a lasting impact. The Battle of Stalingrad ended on February 2nd, when the Soviet Union achieved a decisive victory against Germany. The battle was one of the deadliest in history, with heavy casualties on both sides, and it began a shift in the balance of power in favor of the Allies. The Guadalcanal campaign concluded in February, with a significant victory for the Allied forces in the Pacific. This success marked a crucial turning point in the fight against Japanese expansion in the region. Nazi forces liquidated the Krakow Ghetto in Poland on March 13th and 14th, deporting those who were found to concentration camps. The summer saw several Allied campaigns against Axis powers, including Operation Husky, which led to the fall of Mussolini in Italy. Mussolini was then deposed on July 25th, and Italy surrendered to Allied forces in September. The bombing of Hamburg, Germany, known as Operation Gamora, caused massive civilian casualties and widespread destruction. Roosevelt, Churchill, and Stalin met in Iran from November 28th to December 1st for what would become known as the Tehran Conference. They finalized their plans for the next phase of the war. The conference resulted in agreements on opening a second front in Western Europe and planning the D-Day invasion in 1944. Throughout the year, a severe famine in British India, known as the Bengal Famine, led to the deaths of an estimated 2 to 3 million people. The famine was exacerbated by wartime disruptions and colonial policies, highlighting the broader impacts of the conflict on civilian populations. In 1943, the cultural landscape was marked by events that reflected both the turmoil and creativity of the era, from various art forms, from painting and photography, to literature and music. New artistic movements emerged. Jackson Pollock held his first solo exhibition in November at Peggy Guggenheim's The Art of This Century Gallery in Manhattan, marking a significant moment in the rise of abstract expressionism. Meanwhile, M.C. Escher produced his intriguing lithograph, Reptile, and Norman Rockwell created his iconic Four Freedoms paintings, which resonated deeply with American audiences and bolstered wartime morale. Ansel Adams, known for his landscape photography, turned to documenting the Manzanar War Relocation Center in California, capturing the stark reality of Japanese-American internment camps. Some comic books, like Captain Marvel, continued to sell over a million copies per month, despite paper rationing that reduced the number of pages per issue. In music, this was a year of vibrant performances and emerging stars. Frank Sinatra's appearance at Times Square on January 1st caused a sensation. On January 23rd, Duke Ellington's orchestra performed at Carnegie Hall, raising funds for war relief and showcasing the enduring power of jazz. In November, Leonard Bernstein stepped in as a last-minute conductor for the New York Philharmonic, marking the beginning of his illustrious career. 
The Broadway musical Rodgers and Hammerstein's Oklahoma premiered on March 31st. The show's original cast recording was sold and became a huge hit, setting a precedent for the production and selling of future cast album recordings. Literature and nonfiction works in 1943 featured a diverse selection of influential works, from The Little Prince to A Tree Grows in Brooklyn. Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead was a bestseller. Jean-Paul Sartre's Being and Nothingness was a key existentialist book that examined how people could find freedom and create meaning. Herman Hesse's The Glass Bead Game eventually won the Nobel Prize in Literature. C.S. Lewis's The Abolition of Man argued that modern education should teach students about objective values and morality, warning against the dangers of removing these principles from society. Hollywood embraced the war effort with a wave of films that captured the heroism of everyday men. Movies like Bataan portrayed the brave stand of American soldiers in the Philippines. Bombardier showcased the rigorous training of the U.S. Air Force bombardiers. Destination Tokyo took audiences on daring submarine missions in the Pacific, blending action and patriotism, providing a vital boost to morale during these challenging times. Hollywood Studios allowed the U.S. Office of War Information to censor their films in order to support the war effort and keep sensitive information out of the public eye. This helped create a unified and patriotic message during the war between the studios and the government. The 16th Academy Awards, held on March 2, 1944, was the first ceremony to take place at Grumman's Chinese Theater. Though Casablanca had a limited release in late 1942, it went into wide release in 1943, making it eligible for this year's Academy Awards, where it went on to win Best Picture and Michael Curtiz won Best Director. Paul Lucas was honored with the Best Actor Award for his performance in Watch on the Rhine, while Jennifer Jones received the Best Actress Oscar for her role in The Song of Bernadette, the film that led the pack this year with 12 nominations, but went home with only four awards. George Powell received an honorary Oscar for his innovative work in creating Puppetoons, short animated films utilizing stop-motion techniques. Powell's pioneering contributions would later influence many iconic science fiction films of the 1950s, including Destination Moon, and the War of the Worlds. And once again, there were no nominations this year for science fiction films. The first Golden Globe Awards were handed out this year and awarded The Song of Bernadette as Best Film. Directed by Henry King, this film is a religious drama that chronicles the life of a young girl who claims to have seen visions of the Virgin Mary. And some other notable films released this year include This is the Army was directed by Michael Curtiz and is a musical comedy that features a cast of real soldiers and civilians to showcase the contributions of the Army during World War II. It became the highest-grossing film of the year in the United States. For Whom the Bell Tolls, based on Ernest Hemingway's novel, was directed by Sam Wood and starred Gary Cooper and Ingrid Bergman. It tells the story of an American fighting alongside Spanish guerrillas during the Spanish Civil War. Howard Hughes directed The Outlaw, a Western that became infamous for its controversial portrayal of the legendary outlaw Billy the Kid. The film featured Jane Russell in a provocative role, which sparked significant public interest and controversy, contributing to its status as a cult classic. In the horror genre, The Phantom of the Opera starred Claude Rains as a disfigured composer who haunts the Paris Opera House, while Son of Dracula featured Lon Chaney Jr. as a count who brings terror to the American South after marrying a local heiress. The science fiction cinema of 1943 offered a fascinating snapshot of a genre in transition amid the backdrop of World War II. Despite these constraints imposed by wartime production and the prevailing attitudes that relegated science fiction to low-budget B-films, 
this year marked notable contributions to the genre. Films not only explored new narrative possibilities, but also reflected the anxieties of a world in turmoil, though the final products themselves were not always that well-acted or well-written. The introduction of the first Monster Rally film, the developments of early zombie tropes, and the debut of Batman on screen underscores the creative resilience of filmmakers during this period. As we look back on this era, it's clear that the innovations and themes explored in 1943 laid the important groundwork for the future of science fiction cinema, demonstrating the genre's enduring relevance and creative potential. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for more history of sci-fi content. And I'd like to give a shout out to my Patreon supporters. Thank you for all your encouragement, and I will see all of you in 1944.